Welcome to IPS 520, Quad Machine Learning. All right, so uh, today we're going to continue with our uh, discussion of TensorFlow 2. Um, we're going to get into processing data and a little bit more of Keras. Okay, and you know, as you know, the, as you know this is a little bit more com complicated than what than everything we've done before, but at the same time, uh, it's a lot more powerful. Okay. So before I begin, are there any questions? Uh, yes, Professor. Uh, before we move on with the class, I have a couple of questions regarding the Twitter exam. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we try to do the SKLearn part, uh, when I try to you know put load the CSV file into that, it throws me an error saying that. You know, it cannot convert the, it to string uh, from string to float. Right. So that so, means that you're probably loading either in the features or in the classes a string. You have to convert it to a number. So convert it to, uh, you have to do that in, in, in the Python code. Um, so you have to check your labels. Are your labels numbers or words? Uh, no, they're, they're words. Well, that's, that's your problem there. Weka. I think I said this before, Weka will accept labels that are words, but nothing else does. Okay. Uh, but what about the tweets? The tweets are also the string character. What do you mean the string character? I mean, the tweets are the words, right? They're not numbers, so it's well, not they the same to be numbers, right? You need to use count vectorizer at least, right? To, to take every tweet as a sentence and convert it into a number. That's the exam itself. What you're telling me is, you know, that's one of the, literally one of the main questions in the exam is being able to convert a tweet, which is text, to a feature vector, as you've already done with the count vectorizer example. You understand? Okay. Does that answer your question? Yep, got it. I'll try working on that. All data that gets fed, I mean, you need to really, as I said, this is very important for you to understand this. If you're, if you're still confused about that, you know, that's, that's a problem. Um, so you need to be able to convert, obviously, sentences to a, a, a vector representation. And count vectorizer, which is the code I already gave you, should be able to do that. Okay, thank you, Professor. I'll try working on that. Okay, any other questions? No questions? All right, so the exam is due tonight, correct? Yes. All right, and everyone has gotten their uh, user IDs and passwords and everything, and you've had, you had an extension of a week, so I'm assuming everything is okay in that regard. Um, so yeah, so you just need to, as I said, you need to solve this, this, uh, you need to do this correctly. And that's why I gave you a homework before this exam, right? So that it's pretty much the same thing. So, all right. Doesn't seem like there's any questions. And I really don't want to waste time today because we have a lot of material to cover. As you can see, I'm already on Scholar. And so you can follow along. We're gonna pick up where we left off last week uh, with uh, TensorFlow 2 basics. That's what I was covering last week, I believe. And then I think I just touched on Keras. So again, today I'm gonna touch on it again, but I'll mainly still cover a few of the things related to data sets. Um, and then after that, we will move um, into a couple of problems with Iris, uh, multi-layer perceptrons with MNIST, XOR. So we'll do at least two or three problems. Um, two or three problems should, should be good enough. And then, as I said, you know, that would come, that is what I want to complete this as soon as possible. 
And then that would just leave reinforcement learning and unsupervised learning. So I'm pretty sure we can do unsupervised learning just in one week and reinforcement learning, we'll probably do it in two weeks. So uh, <laughs> you can expect at least two more homework assignments probably, and, and you'll have a written exam and then the project, okay? So that's really what you have left of the semester. I would anticipate two lab assignments at most, I think, or, or, or right about that. Um, and then one final exam, obviously, and then the term project. So I hope that everyone is, you know, you guys are grad students, so you've done this quite a lot already. So I hope you are, you have, if I haven't said this before, uh, you need to form groups of two or three, pick a topic, uh, run it by me, send me an email as soon as possible, just one person per group, and just let me know what you're interested in. Given that we've spent most of our time on supervised learning this semester, that's what I strongly, you know, don't hold out to do the reinforcement learning or unsupervised, okay? Because, you know, I haven't, you know, those are, <laughs> end of the semester topics okay anyway so are there any pro uh, uh, are there any questions about the project all right it doesn't seem like there's any questions so please as i said form your groups of two or three pick a topic you can still stay with the theme of twitter today i'll show you image processing a little bit not image processing but just loading images so you'll have that as well, um, and so on, okay? So hopefully we'll get to that. All right, so it doesn't seem like there's any questions. Therefore, I'm going to just uh, continue. As you can see, uh, you should be able to see the scholar right now. That's what you should be seeing. I haven't updated the code on my GitHub since the last time we met. Therefore, if you still have those files, you can still just use them. Um, you don't have to download them new again. I haven't made, made any changes in the last uh, week. Uh, <coughs> so I'm just going to pick up where I left off. Same approach. That seemed to work really well last week, you know, to speed up. I didn't have to type things. Instead, I just went over the code and I'll be executing, um, and I'll be executing it little by little. So we got to a very nice, and remember with this, you know, I can't stress enough, memorizing is not going to work for you. You know, what I do is I always, I create, you know, you'd be surprised how, how useful GitHub is. You know, I create my GitHub whenever I feel I have good code that I'm going to use in the future, I just load it on my own GitHub. And then whenever I need it, I just reference it from there. And I, you know, it just speeds up everything that I do. And I suggest you do that. You can create cheat sheets on paper and everything, but you know, eventually, um, you know, you're going to run out of, you're going to lose them or anything. Having everything on GitHub is actually quite useful. And I, you know, I'm okay with you using your own resource. So that's not a problem. All right. So anyway, uh, you, you guys study however you want, but the key thing is practice, practice, practice. These things just require a lot of practice and eventually it starts to sink in, all right? But the way the code I'm giving you right now, you should be able to do things just by loading the data without having to do much modification. And to be honest, I'll be honest with you guys, the trick in, in machine learning a lot of the time is that you just use the algorithms as they are. You're not reinventing new machine learning algorithms. In fact, you're just you know, modifying it, tweaking it to adapt to your code or to, sorry, to your data set what I mean. All right, so you should be seeing my um, uh, 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 file explorer. So now I just need to find, I think I was in TF2 basics. And then, uh, so we got, we haven't gotten to functional API. We Keras is where there's the two problems, Iris and XOR. We'll get to that. Oops, what happened? What happened? Guys, can you hear me? I think I lost. Uh, yes. You can hear me, but I got disconnected, I guess. All right, give me a sec.
Professor, can you hear us? I can hear you, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah okay, okay. I'm it's sorry, I connected from Scholar for some reason, but I just got connected back. Okay, so you should be seeing um, my file explorer now on, on Scholar. So what I was saying is, we're gonna get to these problems, Karis. Uh, today we're gonna use this, these images, which are here, okay, the fruit. Um, and then we, functional API, that's the last topic of, of, of this sequence. So we are still here, okay? So we are, last week we covered um, example and we were in TF2 examples. And then activation functions, I'll come back to that once we get further into uh, Keras. So today we're gonna uh, continue with this one. So TF2 examples. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the terminal emulator over here. And I'm gonna run the same commands as usual. <clears throat> All right, so there's bash. And actually I'm gonna Navigate. Okay. All right, so I'm looking at these and it's gotta be TF2 basic. So that has to be the one. And I'm in TF2 basics. Oh, there's a TF2 basic. Okay, so there's a there's a folder in there, TF2 basic. Okay. And then Yeah, there's, there's, these are the folders. Okay, so now I'm going to CD into basics. All right, and there, uh, there we are. It should be TF2 example. So I'm just going to double check. I know I, I made a mark on this last, um, last week. So I think we're going to pick up. Um, so we covered a lot actually, and then here we go. Stop here on November 2nd. So this is where, where I'm gonna pick up, all right? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make sure it still runs. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm already on bash. So conda activate, no, at conda environment list. <laughs> All right, and I'm gonna go into conda activate. Yeah, GP, oh. Underscore GPU. All right, here we go. So now I'm there um, and I still haven't done the update on the GPU box. I just don't need that yet. So I'm in the environment. I'm gonna run this now. TF2 example. I'm sure it's loading. All right, there we go. TensorFlow running some of the code there. I have a Tesla V100 today by default, that's great. And there we go. So that's as far as we got, and we can see the the Keras summary. Okay. So that's one of the things. Remember that what we're doing uh, that the just before when we were working with Weka and we were working with uh, SK Learn, we looked at various algorithms like decision trees and naive Bayes and KNN. Those algorithms are not usually used in TensorFlow, all 
All right, so in TensorFlow, we're going to be limited, not limited, but we're gonna be focused, focused on linear regression. If you're trying to predict, uh, not classes, but just like real valued numbers. But then mainly we're gonna be focused on the algorithms for classification of logistic regression, neural networks, and deep neural networks. So this is not a deep neural net class per se, but just be aware that I think I said this before, I don't wanna repeat it again. Go back to those videos, That's right? So you have an input and an output layer in a logistic regression. In a neural net, you have an input and output layer and in between them, a hidden layer. And in a deep neural net, you have the input, the output, and more than one hidden layer, okay? Plus there's a few other things that make a, a, a neural network from linear, a linear classifier to a non-linear classifier, okay? So that's where we are right now. Okay, so let's go then to the, so remember whenever you see these things in the layer or in the, in the summary, we're building layers basically. So let's go ahead and get back to the, uh, to the code now. So I'm gonna be clear and please, if you have any questions, stop me. Um, so now let's do nano. PF2, all right, and I can scroll all the way down. Here, all right, so Keras. So how do you build things in Keras? So Keras has a very uh, uh, object-oriented way of building things. You know, uses a lot of encapsulation of the low level API code. So basically what you're doing here is, um, you know, as I said, you can do, now you can do big data with GPUs and Scholar. Uh, study, study last week's video or, or two weeks ago, the video on linear regression and logistic regression, all right? And you can see the, the logic here. Uh, remember that basically whenever you're building an, a network, you have the inference function that you're trying to predict, and that's going to be your y equal mx plus b, right? Your c, your c is equal y matrix multiplication, or sorry, not y, x, w plus b, okay? And so that's basically what you have. But the way that you learn these parameters, the W's, the weights, and the biases, is you need to have some kind of an objective. And that is also called the objective function. And usually in linear regression, the objective function that we use is the least squared errors. Whereas in logistic regression, NN and deep neural nets, we're going to use a cross entry. But basically what's happening is you're always going to compare whatever the real labels were versus the predicted labels. And you try to minimize the error somehow. And you're doing that here as well, okay? So that's you know, basically the same logic, just different functions that have different behavior. But we're not gonna get into the details of those uh, in this class. If, if you'd like, if you take 530, the deep learning class, I'll cover that there. All right, so because mainly we're just gonna be limited to these two objective functions in everything that we do. All right, so now that we know that, you know, we've established what we're trying to predict, the objective, how we're gonna, you know, what we're trying to do by, have, by, by having these two functions. And then finally, we need some kind of a, an algorithm that allows us to use that those two functions to solve a problem. And if you remember, that is the gradient descent optimization. All right, so here, what we do is, then we need to build that architecture, right? That's called the architecture. And so to build a model, we have TF Keras sequential. That's the, the module. So from TensorFlow, we called Keras. And from Keras, we called sequential. And that just means that we're gonna have one input layer, and then that's gonna be followed by a hidden layer, and then another hidden layer, and then another hidden layer, and you know, until the end. So really, you start kind of like that. So you can see here, we build a model first, and then we just do model add, and we just start adding layers. So here, the first layer, we say model add, and then we need to specify what type of a layer we want. That just means, you know, how many neurons you're gonna have on it, right? And are they all fully connected? So here we can see the layer is called 
uh, tf dot keras dot layers. And as you might imagine, there's other layers that are not fully connected, et cetera, but this one is connected. And this is called dense, right? And that just stands for fully connected. We specify the number of neurons in the layer. That's going to be units equals 16. And then the activation function. Remember, the activation function is that we have the equation, the logit C equal X times W plus B, but then that C runs through a function. And which one? Could be tangent, sigmoid, you know, softmax, uh, lots of functions. We'll see a little bit of that in the other script that I have. We will come back to that at some point, okay? You saw that I mentioned that I had a, a code for that. But for now, just be aware, you know, we're just gonna use ReLU for now, okay? And then later on, be aware we can change it. So you can see that here, uh, we have activation ReLU, right? And that's what's being specified. So instead of writing it like this, you no longer have to write it like this. Keras just has a way of abstracting it by doing this. Okay, so that's, that's really the trick with Keras. All right, and then, so we do the first layer, then the output of that first layer would be passed to the next layer. And that's this one over here where you see the cursor. And then again, we create another layer, right? And we're gonna say uh, TF Keras dot layers dot dense units 32. Notice this one has more units now. And all of those units will run through every single one of those 32 units, right? Because that's gonna be each one of these. Uh, it's gonna run through a ReLU function, okay? And then that the output of that layer then goes into the next layer. So again, tf.keras.layers.dense. And now notice the units is one. So there's only one neuron. And then um, that, Last one is usually either a softmax or a sigmoid because you want the values to be either zero or one. So that this function, as we will see later on when we do the example, can take any number and basically map it to a, a range between zero and one. And then once you've done that, you basically say, okay, I created the architecture. Now I'm gonna build a model. And now you need to specify the input. It'd be nicer if the input was over here instead of over here, but that's just, you know, Keras, there's like five ways of setting up something. So this is just one of the five. Um, and so here we have input shape. We specify none and four. So what that means is that none means that we can have batches of however many samples we want. So remember, you don't just give it one vector at a time. You can actually give it multiple vectors, okay? All right, and remember, and, and, and then um, we have here four, which is going to mean the number of neurons in the input layer. So that's why it says input shape, right? And then that, that's it. Then that's why when we do the model summary, usually it gives you this, it really is helpful for figuring out the number of parameters, which we saw because, you know, all these layers, we have to calculate all those weights and bi biases. And that's why, even though neural networks have existed since the 40s and 50s, 50s certainly, um, it wasn't feasible to use them because who could calculate, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of parameters? No computer could do that until about 2012 when we had GPUs, or sorry, since, since about 2007 when GPUs became what they are today. All right, so <clears throat> it's very important that you understand this because the types of questions on the exam will be something like this. I'm going to give you this code and I'm going to say, draw the architecture for this network. So who can tell me what would be the, who can tell me what's the architecture for this network? For instance, you need to tell me, you know, what's, what the input layer looks like, what the output layer looks like, how many hidden layers and what they look like. So who can tell me that? What type of a network is this? No one? So this, this, this network looks like, if I switch over to the whiteboard, it's very important. 
Um, it's going to look like what? It's going to have one input layer with four neurons. This is the input. The output looks like this, right? One neuron. And then you have two layers. And these were what? 16 and 32, I believe. So that's dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. 16 and 32. They're fully connected. You don't have to draw all the, con <laughs> but they're fully connected. <coughs> and this one ran through a ReLU. So did this one. And this one runs through a sigmoid, according to that network. Okay. So that's, this is very important that you understand what type of an architecture you're building based on the code. Okay. So that's how it works. Are there any questions? All right. So there seems like there's no questions. So now let's continue. So here you can see I have the comment. So I'm going to move this comment further down. And now we can just continue with new material. So in this case now, let's take a look at some operations, right? So, you know, we've looked at Keras now a little bit, and now I'm just going to continue with more operations and I'm going to focus on loading the data set, which as you can imagine is always a complicated thing. And then after we've gone through all this, uh, we'll come back to Keras and just see a little bit more of it. All right. So, here I have two tensors, tensor, TensorFlow 1 and TensorFlow 2. I'm going to initialize them to be a tensor TF with random data that's random uniform. So this one is a random uniform distribution. This is a random normal distribution. And I'm going to specify certain parameters. So I want the shape to be 5 by 2. So that's like saying that I have five samples with two features each, right? But what's important here is that they both have the same dimensions, okay? They both have the same dimension. So this is, uh, I'm going to do that because I'm going to perform a multiplication of the two, which is going to be element wise versus it being a matrix multiplication, which is something I haven't uh, defined yet, but it's the major operation in all of this. So for the random uniform, I can specify some parameters, min val one and max val one. So that's just I'm going to pick random data that follows a normal distribution within this range. For the other one, TF random normal, I'm going to initialize the same data, but this time it's going to be random from a normal distribution with a mean, zero mean, right, and standard deviation of one, which is a good thing because it's going to give me numbers between minus one and one. That's a normal distribution. That's usually what you want when you normalize your data. You want it to look like that. And, you, and I've said this many times, you should always normalize your data before uh, you do anything else. I'll be looking for that in your code uh, that you submit tonight. All right, so element-wise, you can see here, if we were doing the actual matrix multiplication, we would do something like tf.matmul. Don't forget that. This is the operation that does all the heavy lifting in TensorFlow. Right, the whenever we're doing X times W, that's the operation that we're going to use. However, here I'm just illustrating uh, still just the use of tensors. So we're going to take a look at TF multiply, which is sometimes useful as well. So here we're going to take TF1, whatever it is, and and sorry, T1 and T2, two tensors, and we're going to perform a multiplication that is element wise. And then whenever I want, if I just do it without the NumPy, remember, it's only going to give me the tensor object, but it's not going to give me a NumPy array. So let, let's try that. So I'm going to do control X. Okay. And now I'm going to run it. <laughs> Right, and you can see that the output is a tensor, TF tensor. The data is there, which is a, is a new thing in TensorFlow 2. It didn't used to be there before, and so that's a great addition. But, um, you know, that this may, I will not be able to perform operations on this, you know, necessarily. So I just, let's say, if I just really want 
the data without all the TensorFlow information, the shape, et cetera, I can just uh, go into the code. I can go into the code. And I'm going to add back that dot numpy. So that will allow me to change this from a tensor to a numpy array. And then I can just print T3. And so you can see, I'll be clear here. You can see now it printed out just the data. It's still the same data format, uh, but it's just printed out a little bit uh, differently. All right, so you can see just, you know, pretty simple things, just practicing a few. These are just a few remaining miscellaneous uh, examples I wanted to do um, so that you, you know, you can practice them. All right, so let's move on to the next section. Let's try now. Now that I did the multiply, Notice I'm going to introduce the other operation, which is the mat mol. Okay, and this one you can do um, in various ways. So, in, in, you know, you can do uh, these kinds of things. There's a, there's usually several ways of doing it. So, notice here I'm going to take um, create tensor tensor four tf t four. And we're going to say that T4 is going to be T1. So it's going to be that same one I had over here, a five by two vector that we've seen before, right? I'm going to take T1 and I'm going to apply an operation on axis zero of that one called the reduce mean, okay? Now these functions, reduce mean, whenever you see this, reduce sum, reduce mean, these are operations that were created to apply to tensors, all right? So sometimes, you know, you have, a, a, you have something that is five by two, right? So if you want to apply and calculate the sum of all the values in a column, you know, you can say axis zero, for instance. If you want it, you do the opposite and you want to take the sum of all the values in a row, then, okay, you could do, you know, axis one. Right, for instance, you just change the axis and for every row, it's going to calculate the sum or for every column, it's going to calculate the sum. So that's what reduce means. And then reduce mean, mean actually means the operation you're applying. So if I do sum, it's going to calculate the sum of them. If I do mean, it's going to take the average, the mean of it and so on. All right, so that's basically the idea there. Okay, so let's go ahead and try that one. Um, and there's, so, you'll, you know, these functions, as I said, you just have to practice them, practice them. Eventually they'll click, but that's what they're doing. So let's take a look at this one. So this is five by two, right? Five by two originally. And so now let's take, um, I'm going to do, I'm going to print T1. So I'm going to print T1 there. Right, that's the, that's the tensor that I'm grabbing originally. And so I'm gonna go ahead and run this. Okay, so if you do that, you can see that uh, this is the original. Um, and let me, let me, it's actually this one. Let me put a, a new line character, a new line there, line. So it's a little bit more obvious to visualize, but let's do something like that. So I'm gonna do print. All right, and then I can just write a line. Okay, so I'm gonna try this again. Should be more obvious now. Okay. <laughs> All right, so you can see there's the line. So first, here is the original tensor, right? There's the original tensor. And 
now I perform a reduced mean, which means that I took that original tensor and now notice I did that, I calculated the mean across the, um, the columns. That's why I only have two. Notice that the result is two and you can see the shape of it. So from five, two to just two. I reduced it to just a vector and those are the mean values. If I do the opposite, so I'm gonna go ahead and now change it. So I'm gonna go back to the code. All right, and I'm going to, I'm going to do here. All I have to do is axis one. Axis one, all right, let's change it from zero to one. So I do control X, Y. Now I run the code again. Right, and you can see now I have still my original five, but now I did it on axis one, which means I sort of did it at the per row. And that's why I have one, two, three, four, and five. You can see the shape, the final shape is five. So I did this at the row level. Ten, you know, these functions are actually extremely important, all right, because they speed up everything. Remember that whenever you do deep learning, you're loading data in batches. So you never just load one row, instead you, ro you load several rows, right? And so you wanna perform a lot of operations efficiently across things, all right? So that's, um, that's one of the operations that you, know, you just have to practice it. Any questions about that? All right, there seems like there's no question. So the next step then is to go over here. <laughs> and now, just like over here, I did multiply, which was element wise. Now, we're go now I'm going to do the matmul operation, which you can see here, matmul. And matmul is not an element wise operation. It is instead a matrix multiplication, okay? It's going to be a matrix multiplication. So here I have uh, five and two, right? So I have two tensors, five and two, right? And notice that I'm going to multiply them, but now I'm going to multiply them uh, via uh, Tia linear algebra, lin alg. I take T1 and T2, and I'm going to specify and I'm going to specify here that I'm going to perform an operation, an additional operation called the transpose, okay? All right, so here you can see then we have uh, T1, T2, and then this flag here, <coughs> transpose means that this is gonna be A, all right? So, you know, the first one is A. The first one is A, then, oops. And the next one is B, okay? And so then you imply, okay, I'm going to apply what is called the transpose. And the tra transpose is a way of flipping the data, all right? Flipping the data because a, in a mat mole operation, you can have two tensors that have a different number of rows and columns, right? They can have that. And as long as they are, they, they are aligned properly according to the rules of a mat mole operation, you know, um, things are gonna work out. So this is a function that I have not defined yet, okay? The matmul operation. So uh, I'm trying to get through the code right now, but I will come back to define the matmul operation um, later on, okay? So, so we'll cover that. But if, you, if you'd like, just start looking, you know, the matrix multiplication and linear algebra, and it's very intuitive, right? So it's very intuitive uh, kind of what, you know, what that is, but we'll come back to it. But I, I, would, I would recommend right now, as part of your, you know, your own studies,
just research research this. So this is a, um, a linear out a basic linear algebra operation. Okay. So let's just take a look at at it now and see how it works. So I'm going to take t1 and t2 and I'm you know I, I flip parameter b with the transpose b equal to true and then let's see what the result of this operation is. I go ahead and run it. Right, and you can see here, now I have um, the result of the operation, okay? Basically there, so this is going to be, so if, so if I go back and I do this, I go back and I do this here, instead of NumPy to print the data, I just print the tensor, we can actually see the dimensions of it. So let's go ahead and do that. Right, and you can see here, hopefully, you can notice that the original data was five by two, right, and then I, we performed the operation between the two, uh, the two tensors. The result was five by five. Okay, and you can play around with these dimensions to obtain different kinds of results. But sometimes some of the param parameters don't line up correctly. So, so I'll show you, for instance, here. I'll show you here, if I do instead transpose A equal true, see that I changed. So now I'm going to flip T1 and I'm going to leave B as five by two, All right? So let's look at that. And what do you see? What do you notice? What is the outcome of that? Instead of five by five, what did I get as a result? I got a tensor that was two by two. You see that? So what I, my point is for now, without understanding the intuition, just be aware. When we did the element-wise multiply, we had two tensors, five by two, and the result was a five by two tensor, right? When we do the mat mole operation, the mat mole operation is a matrix multiplication that is defined in a certain way, okay? Uh, using what is called the dot product formula. It's just a formula. Um, and so when we do that, we are doing a different kind of operation and the way that we transpose the elements is going to affect the, the final outcome. So in the initial ones, I flipped B and it gave me a five by five. In the next one, I flipped A and it gave me as a result a two by two. And as I said, both of those things have different meanings intuitively, but that's something that's gonna take a little bit longer for us to discuss. So um, I'll just uh, have a little separate video for that. Now let's try one last thing here as we, as we learn about the mechanics of all of this. How about I just go in here and say comma and I remove the transpose. So neither A or B is going to be transpose. So they're both going to be five by two. Okay, so now they're both five by two, but I'm not performing a, a multiply operation, which is element wise. Instead, I'm performing a mat mole, which is a matrix multiplication. So now I'm going to perform that operation. And what happened? You can see it aired out. You see that? So uh, invalid argument error, matrix size incompatible. And that's what I wanted to show you. This is very important. With element wise, they can both be the same. No problem with multiply. With mat mul, not all combinations will work. It has to be an appropriate one, okay? And if you flip one or the other, you get different results, which have different intuitions. 
And if you don't apply a, an appropriate transpose, you're going to get an error because they must match, as I said, the, the definition of how a matrix multiplication works with the dot product. So hopefully that makes sense for now. Try to digest how that works, okay, a little bit. Um, I do recommend that you take a look at uh, some reading material on that, and then we will come back. I'll do another uh, lecture video just on, on that uh, idea. But for now, I kind of want to make sure I advance with the code. All right, so, so there you have it. Are there any questions about that? And then let me fix this. All right, that's an important concept. It's actually one of the more essential concepts. It's really, I always say, this is where all the heavy lifting happens in machine learning because this operation is implemented in the hardware of your GPU. It's the thing that makes GPUs incredibly powerful, okay? All right, so now that we've covered that, uh, there's just a few uh, other operations over here that I'm kind of just going to illustrate really quickly. Um, so I want to show you, for instance, there's something called the L2 normal, right? The L2 normal. So as you can see, this looks like some equation. So basically, this is written in two ways. So there's two versions of implementing it in TensorFlow. If we take a look at this one, this just says, I'm going to take T1, right? T1, which is that tensor that we've looked at already. So maybe I can print it again. Where was it? So here, so I'm gonna do, all right, T1. I'm gonna print T1. All right, then I grab T1 over here. Let's, let's actually look at the bottom one first. I grab T1. And notice, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to pick the axis, right? Remember, this just means, do I want to do this for every row or do I want to do this for every column? Where do I apply the operation? So you specify one. Okay. Then what are you going to do there? I'm going to take, first of all, I'm going to take all the values in T1 and I'm going to square them, right? And then after I square them, I'm going to sum them with NP sum. Notice that I changed this. Instead of using TF dot reduce sum, now I'm using NP dot sum because that's the, that's the, um, that's the quirk, quirkiness of um, this whole thing that NumPy and TensorFlow all have the same functions. And TensorFlow just keeps making itself look a lot like NumPy. And so at some point they're almost, uh, you can replace one with the other. All right, so <laughs> here we do then, as I said, you square the values in T1 across the X1 axis. And then after you square them, you take the sum of them and then the square root. So this, if you look at this, you can see this is a type of distance function of some type, right? Some kind of a either normalization of a vector or some kind of a, a measurement of something. So what I would suggest is again, you know, do a little bit of research on the L2 norm function, right? You know, find out the equation, you know, in Wikipedia somewhere like that, um, and, and that'll give you the equation, basically. And then try to understand the equation and see how this implementation of the code is the implementation of that equation itself, right? But notice we are basically implementing the equation here and applying it to the tensor T1, and that should give us T1 norm out. Alt just means alternative. The same thing could be done in TensorFlow quite easily by just taking the tf.norm and that way you don't have to write the equation. And that happens a lot in TensorFlow where you don't always have to write the equations because you have all these functions. So notice we still take T1, we specify you know, kind of a square order, right? And then on the same axis, which is one, and then notice over here, we are actually, because we want to compare both of them, it's a NumPy, right? So we make it to NumPy, and then we're going to print both tensors 
which are now NumPy arrays, really. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and do that and just kind of illustrate the example. All right, and so you can see here in these, in these two last vectors, you can see that across that axis one, I have, they're both the same. So I've implemented some equation, which by definition is called the L2 norm. Um, and that equation you can compare using both the function and the, um, using the function um, and also just writing out the code, okay? Any questions? So again, yeah, don't worry too much about this. Just think, you know, usually what I say is all these math linear algebra operations, which by the way, we're pretty much, these are most of what you're going to use. I'm not going to, there's, it's not like there's a thousand of them. There is, a, there are a thousand of them, but you don't have to learn a thousand of them. You learn about five to 10 and you just kind of have to know, okay, the intuition. I use this when I need this and so on. So this one is, you know, in linear algebra, as I said, look it up on Wikipedia, I'm sure you'll find uh, some in information, but basically intuitively, uh, it's, in, it, it's basically for, it behaves in a certain way, like a distance from the origin. So it, you know, as I said, just think of it as some kind of a distance measurement. Um, Yeah, so, it, you know, these are ways of normalizing or, or measuring the distance between something, right? So it gives you a measurement of some, of some, um, something, all right? But anyway, um, that's, you know, another equation that, you know, we have looked at and just really what we're doing, honestly, is just trying to understand how to perform operations with tensors, okay? All right, so now, so you've seen quite a few examples of, of, of making operations with tensors. Obviously, you could do many more. Uh, we haven't covered broadcasting or anything like that, but I think this is a good introduction to these, just to kind of practice and get a feel for how they work. And if anything, if time permits, we will come back. But really, we could spend a long time uh, this is one of the reasons why we've created a new class, as I said to you guys, I think ITS 265, which will have a very strong focus on just these, these concepts, right? But for now, I'm just giving you, you know, a quick and dirty uh, discussion of it. All right. And if you're, more, if you're interested in more, uh, I can certainly point you to those things. But I think this is good enough to kind of um, open your eyes to these things. And now we can move on to the next topic which is uh, data sets in TensorFlow. So as you know, the homework, <clears throat> the, the, the Twitter, uh, the Twitter uh, practical exam that you have for today, due today, was basically the main challenge was getting the data ready for machine learning, right? So usually, oh, are these correct? No. Usually, um, in machine learning, I think I've said many times, you know, you have the algorithms, but you have to write your own code for the data. And that used to be certainly very true. And I'm still kind of a, a little bit of a um, uh, emphasize that you should do that, actually. I, I believe, honestly, that you should write your own code from scratch as far as dealing with your data. However, you know, as you might imagine, data uh, TensorFlow 2 has something for that as well, right? So, so I'm going to cover it here uh, and just think of this as an alternative. So you have the option of using this approach or you have the option of just writing your own code, okay? But this is an example of how to use um, the TensorFlow 2 data sets module, right? Which is supposed to be a way of creating these efficient data set objects. And then you can just use that as well in your machine, you know, to, to plug into your Keras uh, deep learning code. Okay. 
Is that clear, guys? Are there any questions about that? No? All right, so here the example is going to be, uh, we're gonna create a little uh, data set of four samples. So that's four rows and three features per sample or three columns, right? So three features, four samples. So four, a matrix or a tensor that is four by three. So how do we do it? So first, you know, we're gonna do TF random set seed, randomize the data. And then we are gonna create two tensors, TX, T underscore, X and T underscore Y. So T underscore X will be a tensor TF dot random uniform, right? Of size four by three. This is where we specify the size. We're also going to say that it should be float 32. Okay. So just random numbers float four rows, three columns, four samples, three features. each. And then of course, if, now we need to create a, the vector for the labels. So we're going to say tf.range equal four because we have four samples. We need to have four labels. And then notice here, all you have to do then to create a TensorFlow data set is to invoke the tf.data.dataset module. And from there, we're going to call something called from tensor slices. Okay. So that's the function. So basically when you could read your data from a CSV into these two tensors here, TXY and TY, and then load them directly into this module, right? By providing a tuple, notice here the tuple is TX comma TY, okay? We, and that allows us to create in our new data set, you know, call it uh, DS joint or however you want to call it. All right. Any questions about that? No questions. All right. So now that I've created the data set, I can go ahead and view it. Right. So I want to view that now remember now this data set is within DS joint. So I'm going to say, you know, for example, in I'm getting a question about the Twitter exam. Let me just answer this. So it says uh, for the assignment, we have to convert tweets into numbers for SK Learn. Hopefully that should be obvious. Uh, we have given an example equal sentence from the tokens in a website and do the count back. So I just want to confirm that. Yeah, so you just use count vectorizer where you had the sentences. Now you're going to have the tweets. This is a very important concept. If you're still struggling with this, you really need to see me because um, it's, a, it's very important that you understand how to convert something to the vector space model. Okay. Um, it, it's the, cr is the key thing that I'll be evaluating in that exam tonight. All right. Anyway, so now that I have, um, DS joint, the data set, I can just go ahead and do for example in DS joint. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to print the information. So notice here, you know, obviously I X and Y are there. And the way that you read this is that example, notice it's treated as a type of a, of a, of a tuple, right? So you have example zero contains the X part. And then example one, the index one can, contains the other part of the tuple. So then we're just going to print these as dot numpy. So I think, you know, this code should be obvious, um, but let's, you know, go ahead and try it. All right, so here you can see we are printing, and I really should print out more lines, to, but uh, you can see here, I printed out the four samples. You can see I printed out, uh, there's four 
times three, right? So it's four samples, one, two, three, four. Each one has three features. So one, two, three, one, two, three, and so on. And then the labels, I just created some random numbers there. Zero, one, two, three. Obviously, it would, it would be preferable for it to be like zero and one, something like that. This is just an example to show how you can create a data set. And then from here now, if you want to take this TensorFlow approach to doing your data sets, you know, it does have some advantages. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, you know, you just have to understand I, this is new. So for me, I, I will prefer just what I'm used to, which is creating my own data sets. But, you know, uh, certainly that this could be very helpful to you. All right. So now that that's created, uh, we can go ahead and go back to our code once again more. All right, and we've covered these examples and now we're in data set. So that printed out our data set for me. I think pretty straightforward. All right, then I'm gonna move the comments further down. All right, and now let's look at some of the advantages of using, some of the advantages of using um, the data set. All right, so now notice that what I'm gonna do is, um, so now I'm going to take over here, initially I had TX and TY. Then the advantage of this is I've now created the object DS joint. So literally I can't, let's say that you have created MNIST or IRIS, right? So I think you saw this in SK Learn. You would create those objects and then you just called it MNIST or IRIS and then you could move the data set just by referencing that object. Well, it's the same here. Now we have DS joint over here, right? So I have all the data in there and now I can do things to the whole data efficiently. So for instance, I can use the data sets built-in function called map. Map allows me to transform my data. So for instance, what I want to do here is I want to perform what is called a lambda operation, which is usually just a, a modification, right? So I'm going to apply this. So I have obviously X and Y in this data, right? Um, and I'm going to then, um, I'm going to go into this data because it's, you know, it, it's, it, what it, the, the, the tuple is not called X and Y. So don't, don't think of it that way. Instead, instead think of it as there's a tuple and you're naming it at this point X and Y. And then here you can specify what operation should be applied to Y. So if you look carefully, Y, nothing is happening to it. It just stays the same, but X gets this operation. So every original X will now be multiplied times two minus, and then minus 1.0, okay? And so that's what's gonna happen to the data. It gets basically transformed. So now that's why I changed the name of DS joint to DS transform, okay? So now the data transform, we do the same thing we do over here, for example, in DS transform, and I'm gonna print every single one of these values. So pretty much the exact same thing. I'm going to add a, a print over here just to, <coughs> <clears throat> so I know where I am. All right, so now I can do this and then I can run my code. All right, and let's analyze the code. So if you notice, this was the original data over here. This was the original data. And then this is the data um, after the operation. Okay. So this is, so the labels didn't change. And then you just have to think that the X data was, you know, multiply times two and then minus one. Right. I think that's what it was. And so this is the, the transform data and that, that what I wrote there, you could apply any kind of equation, right? So that's up to you. So maybe you're doing a normalization. So you could just write out the normalization in there very conveniently. 
So remember, the advantage of these things is that probably before these types of classes, you always thought, oh, whenever I have a, a two-dimensional matrix, I'm going to use nested for loops. The problem with nested for loops, they're highly inefficient. Um, and so here we're performing these types of operations. The code is optimized to do these matrix type of operations, and it's going to be way faster. And I promise you, this is the difference between many hours and just, you know, minutes. So you, you would definitely appreciate this when you're dealing with big data. Okay. Let's go back. So any questions about that? Is all of this making sense, guys? All right, and I got a I got a thumbs up there, so good. All right, so um, please stop me. As I said, you know, a lot of this practice, practice, practice. All right, so data sets certainly we've we've taken a look at it. We did the transform and the lambda operation with a map. So we're here. So now uh, let's just look at a few other operations, and that's you know pretty much the same thing. Now notice this one, probably, probably go a little bit faster here because uh, it's really just additional operations. So the data set was called uh, ds.joint. So you can once again uh, reset everything randomly in your data set. Then you can take ds.joint and now you can say, you know what, I want to create, I want to use ds.joint, but let's say that I have this in a for loop where I'm doing, you know, a thousand, a hundred epics. Every epic, you know what? I want to take the data set. I want to say that the buffer size is going to be, you know, whatever. So in this case, the buffer size is the entire data set because we're doing length of TX, right? If you remember, T, the TX was size, what? Four, because we have four samples with three features each. So you're saying here, buffer size, for all the data, shuffle it. So what that means is that every iteration that I'm doing this, I could run this one function over here and shuffle the data. What does that do? It means that, let's say, let's imagine that I have a bucket, right? And in my bucket I have, I grab all the blue balls and I put them in first and then all the red balls and I put them last. What's gonna happen if I don't do the shuffle? Every time I reach in in the beginning, what do I grab initially? a red ball, right? Because those were the last in. But if I do shuffle every time, it's like you grabbed all the balls, threw them in the air, and now you kind of shuffle them in. And now your probability of grabbing a red ball goes down, right? Because they're shuffled. And so remember as far, and, and remember the intuition. Why do we do this? Remember the giant going over the mountain range. You don't want that giant to start in the same peak every time, right? Because they're going to end up in a valley that's not the deepest. And so you end up in what is called local minima. Whereas if you're shuffling these, sometimes you start in another position and another position and another position. Eventually, by doing that one iteration, you will get to the optimal minimum. And then those are going to be the weights that get saved because they were the, the lowest. Okay. So that's why we do this intuitively. But here, so then this is the shuffle, right? And so basically what you do here is you print the batches, but now shuffle, do the same thing. For example, in DS, you know, and you print them out. So that's pretty straightforward. I'm just gonna quickly demo that one. Oops. Right, you can see, so the data has been uh, shuffled shuffled in. So you could do this in a for loop. So what my recommendation is for as far as your homework, um, check this out, right? So, so verify. So for instance, here, the first one was in when, the, when not shuffled, the first one was 16, 90, 63, right? Now 16, 90, 63 is the third one. The second one, which was 43, 29, 63, Four, it is now, oh, actually, that's still the same. Well, that's great. And then 97, 43, 66, with the third one, is now the first one. So they've been shuffled. And you can do this every single time. 
you don't sh the, the labels and, and, and notice that the labels and the samples go together. So for instance, 9743 is label two and now 9743 and label two. You see that? So the, that order was maintained, which is obviously essential, but at the same time, you were able to help yourself find the global minimum <clears throat> by initializing your data appropriately. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Okay. All right. So as you can see, very, very, very powerful stuff that you can do with um, with uh, TensorFlow and TensorFlow 2. All right, so we've covered transformation, we've covered shuffling. Now we can cover batches. So one thing that you're going to have to do in, in big data is you have to read the data in batches. What that means is the following. Let's say that I, you know, you've got you know, let's, let's say with the election, for instance, you have, you know, you know how critical it is, right? And you had all these, you had, let's say 10 million tweets, right? Or, or 10 million Facebook posts or something. There's no way that you can take all that 10 million and load it into RAM at the same time, right? That, that would just not be feasible. And so what you do is you need to read the data in a for loop. You say like, I'm going to read a hundred, load them, another 100, load them 100 as you're training, right? That is called reading the data in batches. And that is essential to big data processing. So here, what we're gonna do in this example is you're gonna see that the TensorFlow2 object that we've created, DS joint, has a function called batch, right? And what that means is, remember, right now you have all the data in there, right? So you have your data in there. Um, and you're going to load the data in batches into the data set. So here I'm gonna say that the batch is three. So that means that out of the four samples, I'm only going to read three in, and I'm gonna say drop remainder false. So that just means you don't drop, especially when it, it's like, it's not gonna be three for the remaining, it's just gonna be one. All right, so then, but that's basically all it is. So you define the batch size, and then now the object has been created into a set, imagine it's now a list of batches. So now this DS is really a list of batches. So you can even try to print it, for instance. Uh, I don't know what information this will give us, but we can take a look at it, right? It has, it's sort of like, it's now a list of batches. And then basically we can use the Python built-in iter for iteration and next functions. And this will allow us to, from DS, grab, you know, iterate through the objects as a list. And then, uh, and actually it might be good to do iter here as well. And I'm gonna do up here, print yes, because this is the object. All right, and so now um, we can just grab the first one by saying next, obviously in a for loop, we would, uh, we would use this to grab every single one. And then that gives us again, as you might imagine, a batch of three of X values and Y values. So now we have batch X and batch Y. As you will see later on, and you've seen in SK Learn, this is like saying X train, Y train, right? So that's, you know, or X test, Y test. Either one would be represented in this format over here. All right, and then now we can just go ahead and print out the results. We're gonna take this, the tensor and convert it into NumPy again, just for, convenience. So let's go ahead and do that one. I like to see that. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, do that. All right, and so now we can take a look at, at the data. So you can see we printed out um, the object, right? Batch data set, we created it, right? You can see there's some kind of a tuple there, right? And then after that, you know, the other one, the iterator object, you can see we created them. And then you can see here, we printed out 
because we said batches of three. So notice that it only gave us three. Instead of giving us the entire data set of four, it only gave us the first three, right? Because we said next, and we would have to say another next to get the other, the other batch. So we would have to iterate through the data set. Obviously, this would make more sense if we had a much larger uh, data set. But it gave us the, the samples, and it gave us the labels, and they're still aligned. So if I take the last one, 974366, that's two, and I can confirm that by going over here, and that's two. So they are still very much aligned, but also now I can iterate through this data efficiently. Any questions? All right, so this is where we are. So it doesn't seem like there's any questions so far. All right, so um, we did the batches, we did shuffling. You can see all these things are built in, a little bit um, useful. And this was batch. All right, so now let's look at sort of the same thing here. You know, another example, join, create batches. Um, you know, another function repeat. And then here we can say uh, enumerate DS and print out not just the data itself, but also like an index, which would give us batch numbers. So this is useful whenever you want to keep track of batch numbers. So you would print out I. So here, for instance, we can say I batch X shape and then print out batch Y numpy. Right. So let, let me add the comment here. And then, you know, for some of these, I'm just going to let you guys play with them. I think at this point, you should get the gist of what's going on. But the best way to understand this is to kind of grab a data set like Iris and just play with it. But you can see here, we were able to print 0, 1, 2, 3, you know, and so on. Um, and then we have some of the data there. Printing out the shape, all right? We, we did here 3 and 3. Right, um, and then these are the labels, and then we printed out the last batch, which is one by three, right? Um, and then again, we repeat the process. So we just printed out the same stuff. So that's where the repeat comes in. We did it twice. All right. All right, so we're doing good time. Let's see, we have one minute left before we take our 10 minute break. Uh, let me see what's next. Repeat. Oh, perfect. That was a great uh, stopping point because that concludes the, the basic examples of dealing with a data set, you know, uh, shuffle, batch, repeat was the last one. And now we are ready. You notice the next section is the very exciting reading fruits. So in, in particular, we're going to be reading images. Okay, so now that that's excellent because it makes the other video more a little bit more about images on its own. Uh, and so we're going to play play around with it. Okay. Um, so, okay, so let's do that. So it's exactly 320. I'm going to stop right now here. And we'll be back. I'll be back in 10 minutes. I'm going to start generating this video and then we will continue. All right. So I'll be back in 10 minutes. You can take your break. 